Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, the Corona edition. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. I'm Gavin Ashenden. It's the 10th of March, 2020. All right, welcome to another program of Anglican Unscripted. We appreciate you're here. We appreciate that you're viewers and that you love us. And we, you, you go to the comment section and comment. We love that as much as well because that's where the conversation continues. If you have not liked us yet on Facebook or YouTube, just click that little thumbs up. That lets the algorithms know that this is a good show. You liked it and they should probably help promote it as well. If you had not subscribed yet to the program, please click the subscribe button on YouTube. It's a little red rectangle there. You click that, a little bell is going to come up, and you click the bell, and supposedly, maybe, occasionally, we'll give you instant notification of the next show. Uh, what else do we need? Oh, we have a podcast. This show is recorded in two formats, one for video on YouTube. We also have a podcast uh, synced up to this as well. If you go to the show notes on YouTube, you click on the link, you will be able to download our podcast so you can listen to us driving to work whenever you work. Uh, guys, the zombie apocalypse is all I can think of when I watch the news. Uh, before we get too far, the news that we're basically going to talk about is coronavirus related because that's just affecting the markets, it's affecting the church, it's affecting our social interactions. We are told to uh, be aware of who we're with and stuff like that. And I think we need to give a reality check on the coronavirus, talk about uh, this versus other epidemics in the last 10 years, and just give you kind of the godly take on uh, pandemics. Uh, how do we start this off? Let's start with Rome. Uh, the Vatican says no more outdoor services or big services until April 4th. George, that's, that's a big step for the Vatican. Well, it's more than that, Kevin. The Italian Episcopal Conference on Sunday, the 8th, uh, said that there will be no public celebrations of the Eucharist until April 4th. Now, that means regular Sunday morning church services and services with lay people and uh, clergy. There may be private celebrations of the Eucharist. In other words, priests are permitted to celebrate the Eucharist in private, and people are encouraged to engage in spiritual communion. Uh, but I think this is the first time, uh, I don't know since when, uh, certainly uh, certainly during the Second World War, services weren't disrupted uh, or, uh, or any major crisis of this sort. So it's quite, it's quite a, a major step by the Catholic Church, given the centrality of the sacraments in their lives, to say that we're suspending this uh, for a month. Well, last night, Gavin, I saw the news that Italy has basically shut down. Uh, you're currently traveling in Europe. You were in Holland last week. You're in France. If I'm looking at the background of your, your studio there, you're in France today. And that's big when a country uh, in Europe shuts down and closes their borders and says nobody can go back and forth. First of all, it's very scary. But it also tells us that um, they're trying to treat this disease by isolation that the best way to, to stop germs from coming in or going out is to isolate ourselves. Uh, have you ever seen anything in the last uh, 20 or 30 years like this in Europe? No, I haven't. And on, on the train from uh, Nijmegen to, to, to Paris, there was a woman sitting opposite me in her late 20s, and she had one of these big fluffy sweaters with a almost like a cowl at the front or the back, depending which way you pulled it. And she, she pulled it over her face. <laughs> And I thought, that's such a stupid thing to do. The masks don't do anything. They, the masks protect the person who's wearing them from scratching their face with their own fingers. They don't stop anybody else's germs. And, and the idea that a sort of rather, rather woolen garment could do that, I thought it was really rude and um, unhelpful. But of course, we all look at each other um, when someone only has to start coughing. And, uh, and there's a resonance of the Black Death is there. This 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 is very odd. I'm I was reading some very interesting 
uh, stuff in the, in the magazine called The Spectator. And um, Rod Little, who's one of my favorite journalists, was saying that on, on, the, on the left, pandemic is received by people who welcome it as, as the apocalypse that they have been expecting and that it will provide for the punishment of all fascists and, and, and bigots. <laughs> and, uh, and at the same time, create a, a, a disastrous meltdown in society. And on, on the right, people say, look, for goodness sake, it's just another version of the flu. We're all going to die anyway. Um, which only goes to show I'm more right of centre than I thought I was. <laughs> but the, the interesting, th I, the thing that surprised me is there's a certain amount of apocalyptic literature amongst the mystics. Um, and, and there's one strain that said uh, the, the end, the, the eschaton will, will be closer. And there are versions of the eschaton um, when the perpetual sacrifice is abolished. And most people say, well, that's the mass. And then they said, yeah, but the mass is never, ever going to be abolished. How, how, could, how could that ever happen? And then 30 seconds ago, I heard George explaining to me how it could happen. And so I'm going, oh, <laughs> it has happened. This, this, this needs rethinking. <laughs> well, I mean, truth be told, back in the 80s, I got into uh, Christianity early on for the sci-fi part, the revelation, the... Uh, uh, all the fun parts that I was being preached to on on TVs uh, by the Jim and Tammy Bakers, the uh, um, Jimmy Swaggerts of the day, telling us about the end times, the revelations, and how it would all occur. That was my, my little 18, 19 year old brain. That was that was cool. That was sci-fi. I think there's still that realm in people's mind of how they interpret revelation and everything is pious bias here. They see pestilence. Well, here it is, end times. They see the markets crashing up. Ah, here we are, end times. And they have such a short memory that, you know, the church has gone through uh, Hitler, Stalin, all these things in the last 2000 years that make today's uh, pestilence look minor in comparison. I think the church and society and humans have a very short memory of what we've already been through. And I think this is even more climatic with this coronavirus because we had SARS, which was the worst virus 10 years ago. And because of when it occurred, it wasn't so bad because there was no Facebook. There was no YouTube. There was no way to get instant notification and instant analysis from pundits and talking heads. CNN used to actually be a news station back then. So much has changed Kevin. in how we get our information that I think we will, we've all gonna have lost that long-term perspective forever. You're absolutely right, Kevin. I know in my ministry, I spent several years in hospice and in hospital chaplaincy as a staff chaplain. And I uh, was uh, working in that field during the AIDS crisis uh, when it was called uh, gay men's uh, disease. It wasn't sure. called HIV AIDS. Yeah. And yeah, I was working in hospice and we didn't know how this was spread. And so when uh, we, you know, we were instructed by our medical uh, directors at the hospice in essence to wear hazmat suits as we were ministering to men dying of AIDS because could it be their tears could it be their breath could it be some miasma coming from them in other words the and there was a terrific uh, well there's always been a social stigma against homosexuality but at that time and South Florida being slightly Hispanic macho culture that uh, prejudice uh, was reinforced by a plague worldview that, you know, gay men have this disease. And this was the era where Pat Robertson would get on the TV and say that this was God's punishment to the, to the gay people. Now, of course, we now know how HIV is transmitted and uh, there are people who have been living with the virus with, under medical care for 20, 30 years now. So the apocalypse, but you're right, Kevin, because we did not have social media, uh, in other words, there were years, y yes, years when I would come home and I would undress in the garage and I would drop my clothing straight into the washing machine after every day at work because I didn't want to, I didn't know what I was bringing home. And, but because there was no real social media, uh, to sort of inflame people, I don't think we had that degree of hysteria 
that we have certainly today with the uh, with the uh, virus coronavirus well we have shown the worst part of us as humans and that's how we express our fear we express our fear currently the symbol is toilet paper mm-hmm. you know we will stand in line at Costco and BJ's and the supermarket in order to be sure that we have enough toilet paper on hand either for the next socialist revolution with uh, Bernie Sanders or something to do with with coronavirus diseases. Now I was at the shopping center almost four or five days ago. I walked by the disinfectant aisle, empty. I walked by the Kleenex and toilet paper aisle, empty. Apparently, when you run out of toilet paper, Kleenex is a good substitute. I didn't know that. I, you know, I, I'm an uneducated uh, toilet paper consumer. So this is our fear. This is how we express ourselves. We want to be sure that we have products on hand to help us feel comfortable. And that's why in Florida right now, Kevin, there are lines at stores, but it's to buy ammunition. That's why. Uh, I don't mind that. <laughs> we just, if, if the apocalypse doesn't come, it's toilet paper's not going to uh, repel the zombies. Uh, good, uh, good supply of long-tipped uh, ammunition, uh, long-tipped bullets will. So let's look at a little bit of church history of how church um, has dealt with pandemics and dealt with uh, things that were scary. And this is one of those times where uh, I always tell people the message that God is unshaken in this. God, well, okay, go on. Well, it, uh, to me, I find this fascinating. Nobody else does. But 1547, I think we had the Sacrament Act in the Church of England under sure. King Edward, where it said that the sacrament must be presented in two kinds, except under exceptional cir- circumstances. And that exceptional circumstances was never exercised until 2007 under the SARS outbreak. Uh, yes, under the SARS outbreak. Right, yeah. so, and so during the influenza epidemic of 1918, 1919, during the cholera epidemics, uh, through all out history in the Anglican world, two, two elements must be presented. And if you actually look at the debates at the time, the exceptional circumstances weren't hygiene. It were the circumstances that you find in places like the Congo where wine is not going to be had and therefore, you know, you're, they're not going to withhold the Eucharist for a community that has not seen wine for generations. But so, but it, under Rowan Williams, the, the first break, crack in the wall came of, of presenting only in one kind. And now you have bishops saying, oh, well, it's a long established custom that only one kind is fine and all this and that. Well, it's a long established custom since 2007 uh, in the Anglican world. But yeah. I, I guess that's that's sooner than yesterday, which is the current Episcopal custom. If it's happened yesterday, that's a long standing tradition. Gavin, is it the best uh, um, way forward for churches just to close their doors and say, it's just too dangerous to come here? I think it depends whether you're a supernaturalist or not. Uh, I spent a lot of my life being ambiguous about the supernatural um, because I didn't like the idea of people claiming things for God that he wasn't doing. But I think when it comes to the Eucharist, uh, some parts of the church define themselves by their understanding of the Eucharist as being supernatural. It's one thing that indeed that divides the church. So if you're on the side of the line that says, well, you know, maybe it isn't, then I think it's perfectly proper for you to take put hygiene before everything else, and you should. If you're on the other side of the church that says, this is Jesus, then I think it's ludicrous to go for hygiene because it's better to be dead with Jesus inside you than alive without him. And uh, I, I'm, I'm astonished that the Catholic Church has cleared out its holy stoops, uh, stopped the mass and, um, and, and done some other things because, uh, I mean, that's what it believes and so if it believes it do it and if you don't believe it well become a protestant so you know maybe there are a whole lot of people in, in the vatican who really should sign up to uh, to the episcopal church and they'd be much more comfortable there uh, i have a number of, of, of uh better previous... pension nicer clothes <laughs> <Better> pension. <laughs> you can get married <laughs> and, and, more, and more hygiene too by the sound of it 
I, I have a number of, of Catholic uh, friends I used to work with who are quite liberal on Facebook, and they are making a, their virtue signaling by showing how they've emptied the holy water out and then, then doing some kind of, some kind of green message at, at the end of it. And I think you know, this, this is not Christianity. Um, well, it's certainly not Catholicism. Uh, well, I, I, Gavin, I really you... think that people. Go on, George. I wanted to ask you. We uh, last week, uh, I uh, during the middle of the show, I took ill. It wasn't the coronavirus; it was a stress headache, uh, <laughs> and uh, it only got worse over the weekend. But we were talking about Lords and how they, uh, the administrator, has emptied the uh, the water that the pilgrims come to. Explain explain the thinking behind Lords Water and the pilgrimages and the sort of uh, disconnect between that we seem to be go that seems to be going on there and lords with this sorry oh, this george, you, you don't know how you don't know how much i love you george <laughs> um the thinking uh, whether one accepts it or not and um, and we have to acknowledge there are lots of people for whom the thinking is uncomfortable and uh, because they they think it's not telling the truth however the internal thinking is uh, that this is a place where miracles happen and people got healed and the Catholic Church went to a lot of trouble to set up a big medical uh, panel to test these claims, and many of them passed the panel. So if that's what you believe, if you believe that those waters, through the mercy of God and his kindness, uh, a bit like the spittle of Jesus on the eyes of the man born blind in, in, in St. John, if you believe that, that through this material things, God makes people better, why would you close it down? It must imply you don't believe it. Well, if you don't believe it, get out or, or close it down forever and say, I'm sorry, we made a mistake. Or, or <laughs> um, I remember, George, the, the, well, I, I once, it, it, go, go on. It, have they offered, uh, in other words, have they offered an explanation that it's not the holy water per se, but this the spirit that lies behind it, therefore you might as well stay home and not buy the bottle of holy water in the shop or... What, what, how can they justify <laughs> this or just did they just put out a little close, uh, closed for, uh, closed for the coronavirus season? How is one this of the things I've, to the faithful there? Well, one of the things I've noticed in the Catholic Church, and George, I'm, 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 a, I'm a rookie. I'm, what do I know? I'm, I'm discovering things as I go along. Uh, I have to tread very carefully everywhere I go. Um, but, but I've discovered that not everyone believes, well, well First of all, there's a vast range of Marian apparitions, vast from the first century to today, and the, across the centuries, and they differ in quality, they differ in message, and the church quite rightly says, we're not gonna swallow this just because someone believes it or says it. So, so the, already there's, an, there's a perfectly proper internal debate, but even besides that internal debate, there are people who say, well, actually this doesn't work for us at all, we don't like this. Uh, and, um, and so you have kind of, um, f almost like fashions of spirituality, and there are certainly some very uh, intelligent Catholics who look at the Marian apparitionists as the, as the kind of crazy army part of the church. <laughs> and, um, but however, uh, th there are places where the church has looked at it and said, we do believe this. And therefore I don't understand spokesmen for the church saying, having said we believe it, we're now gonna treat it like it's a hygiene emergency. It, it's one or the other. So you know, you, you're perfectly entitled to make up your mind, but stick with what you believe. We have the same trouble in the Protestant church. We have essential oils that you can buy that will either help you lose weight or help you <laughs> smell better or uh, heal you of many different ailments. Uh, yeah, there's there's stuff in the church that are fringe, on, on the fringes that, that the whole church itself doesn't understand. Uh, and there's stuff that we just use that unifies us. And I think uh, we are finding more and more as the days go by and the years go by and the centuries go by, the stuff that unifies us is more important than the, the fringe stuff, but the fringe stuff is still interesting. And it Pardon. still can be of God and we just you know, haven't brought it into our, our belief systems yet. George? Part of, my, part of my, I guess, bias or the presupposition I bring to these arguments is I guess I'm a libertarian in so many ways. Um, it's fine when when the bishop, like the Bishop of Washington, D.C., or uh, some Anglican churches in the British Isles, the Scots, I think, or the Welsh, no, it was the Church of Wales, say, you may not give, uh, only the priest may have wine, nobody else may have that. 
because of the risk of coronavirus. I don't know if I agree with that. I mean, because I think you need to be able to make the choice for yourself. Do I, am I, in other words, to have the priesthood make this decision on your behalf, and if you believe, as Gavin laid out, uh, you have a particular theology about the validity and the efficacy of the sacraments, um, that's, that's rather insulting, I think. Um, I, I just don't believe that the church should be in the business of telling. It can recommend, it can urge. But, you know, at the end of the day, uh, it's got well, to be I don't mind people. I don't mind people saying, if you come to church or to a liturgical service, uh, let's get rid of the chairs and you must stand an arm's width away from anybody near you. I think that's perfectly sensible. I don't see, uh, there's no theology of holy space that says you're immune from a stone falling on your head or catching a, catching a nasty infectious disease from someone's neck to you. I, I, I'm absolutely with that. It's just it's just the Eucharist. If it's, if it's what they say it is, then it's fine. If it's not what they say it is, then we need to change churches. Um, so I, I, but it goes further than that. I mean, one of the things I, I I'm becoming what's called a trad Catholic George. I, I guess it suits my psychological profile. Um, but but once once it was explained to me why people kneel and take it on the tongue, I went, oh yeah, I get that. I'd like to do. I'd like to tell Jesus how much I love him by doing that. So not everyone does. Now in, in Catholic circles, the big argument is whether you take him in your hands. You're in control. You might drop him. There are, you know, from a traditionalist point of view, it's a, it's a third-rate way of doing it. But one of the things they've changed is nobody gets to have him placed on their tongue now because they've made that decision, just as you have described. And I'm, yes. I'm with you. I think that's that's, you know, that that, that that's an improper decision to, for authoritarians to make. I think when we see things like SARS and coronavirus, we find out what the church really believes. The church really believes in protecting, uh, in a whole sense, in a temporal sense, the bodies of the people who are coming to church. You know, they want to be sure that the people 50 and above us don't get sick and die. Um, and this is the way they, in their minds, they can best protect us is by shutting down the churches, changing the Eucharist, uh, making sure that when we pass the peace, we don't touch each other, and that, like in my church, we do intinction. Where are the intinkers? Um, there's there's ways in which the church wants to protect the human bodies of their uh, congregants. You invited us to go back into history, and 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 if we do, we go to the black the uh, the black death. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that marked the way the church behaved during the black death is lots of clergy stayed with their people and looked after them. And sometimes the clergy survived and sometimes they died. But but they all were not afraid of death. They weren't afraid to love people in the face of death. And and the fact is we're, we're going to die. I think the reason this pandemic is particularly problematic, of all the things you discuss, discussed about social media, but ever since we invented antibiotics, we've begun to assume as a culture that we can postpone death much of the time. Clearly, aging gets us in the end. But between between fatalistic aging, there are a few things like cancer and AIDS which upset us. But there's a mindset that we ought to be in control, and it's a very anti-Christian mindset. And I think one of the one we, we talked about this slightly uh, a few sessions ago. But I think one of the messages of Christianity offers to people is, is a reality check. Look, you're going to die. What, are you, what have you got this time for? It could be you've got this time to prepare for heaven, to get to know God. Um, and, and it may be cut short, in which case that would be a good thing. Um, if, if I went tomorrow, I dare say people might, might, might miss me, but there'd be quite a lot of struggling that didn't happen. <laughs> My cat would miss me. <laughs> well, you're absolutely right in that uh, two points I want to make. Uh, one, uh, the, the historian Victor Davis Hanson, Victor Davis Hanson, uh, he's a political commentary and classical historian. He had, a he had a fascinating article that came out the other day where he looked at the plague of Athens uh, under, the, I think it was Thucydides the, or Pericles, the, the plague mm -hmm. under Justinian in Constantinople and the Black Plague and the, and the current uh, coronavirus and the same sort of response that it, 
that occurred across these uh, uh, incidences is now taking shape in the psyche of people in the West with coronavirus, uh, of basically being a seminal moment of change. Now he says it will play out. You know, we don't know if that change is there, but you know, this certainly is can be one of those points. But the other point that I wanted to get is we had a staff meeting yesterday, and uh, there are five clergy at my church, and uh, and we gather every Monday morning uh, for a staff meeting with the office. And one of the things I discussed is says, now that I leave the choice to you, but the time will come. We have a majority older population. People are going to get sick. It's eventually going to get here. I will not require any of you to do home pastoral visits if you feel in your conscience that your health will not permit it. And to a man and to a woman, each of them, as as well as myself, the health consequences of doing the pastoral visits would be in the back of our mind, but we would still do them. And this is just as what Gavin says. Uh, yes, it's frightening. Yes, uh, we'd rather not have it to be this way, but we feel what we are doing is of such importance, not only to our own souls, but to those whom we are called to minister that this is the test of are we being true to our faith. But I'm not going to make it someone else take that test unwillingly. That's why I gave my, mm -hmm. my, my assistants the option, you know, we have what, what our bookkeeper is pregnant. She's going to have a baby soon. And so we talked to her and I said, if you would like to work at home, you may, uh, because we don't want to put you in a position where you're fearful for the birth of your child. And on the bell. <laughs> Whom does that bell toll for? What well, that was perfect, Gavin. Yeah, you know, I don't know. You, you, you arranged that. Now, that's one of the biggest symbols of the church, though. Uh, we get that through Christ, who uh, saw a man in the field. Man said, "Unclean, unclean." And what did Christ do? We are called to do the same. We're not called to to worry about whether or not we're going to be infected. We're not called in any way, shape, or form to do anything other than what God would do, Christ would do. Now, there is, though, a danger, which is to confuse sort of, if you will, the sacramental spiritual life with the regular old church political log-rolling life. In other words, I personally would urge the people organizing the Kigali Conference for GAFCON to consider moving it to another time. Uh, maybe to the fall after the the summer passes and the medical season ends, because frankly, a political gathering of men in their sixties from around the world, uh, in a place where uh, sanitation is not as good as it could be, I don't think that rises to the occasion of visiting the sick during a plague year. Uh, well, do you think Lambeth will happen, George? I mean, it's quite possible that if that's the big question, who is going to send Justin Welby a case of Corona? And, and Lambeth for, for this, this year? Well, I think what we're going to, I'm just, who knows, but my sort of sense is that what we're going to see is that we're going to see the British government basically refusing entry to people from certain parts of the world. Yeah. So it lets, right now, Iran is one of the epicenters and it's just started to spread to Pakistan. Uh, it's going to hit the Indian subcontinent eventually because sanitation there, as we know, is just abysmal. And the population. You, you think of Indian in any any Indian city uh, where the populations are in the millions and the people are just, you know, shoulder to shoulder. That's going to be an so amazing... Let, let's say by May or June, it's now raging through northern India and Pakistan. Um, will the British government... Well, that's a political context because it's India, but let's take uh, Pick a different another country. <laughs> part. You know, will the British government begin closing off? I mean, the British government is very quick to close off entry from African countries during times of political unrest because their people won't go home. Will politics and India, for example, my daughter is planning on a trip to India this summer before she starts graduate school. And in applying for her visa, uh, one of the things she found out from the embassy staffers is that the Indian government is mulling over whether or not to ban people from California visiting the country. She lives in California, and California is where the uh, disease is right now. And so India may take the precaution of not allowing Californians or Americans in. So I think I think the political 
To be frank, I don't see Welby pulling the plug because this is too much of his self-identity of I need the unity at all costs. But I do see circumstances greater than Justin Welby uh, intervening to sort of screw this up. The well, University of Canterbury saying we're not going to let you use yeah. our facilities. That was what I was going to say. It's much more likely that the university will say we, we refuse to take responsibility for bringing people together at a time like this to abroad or, or we'd we have a duty to our own students. Mind you, they're all coming from abroad too. So, well, however, I can well imagine that they would take a step like that. All the bishops stay in the dorm rooms. They use the cafeterias. They mingle in t into town, into Canterbury. Uh, they own Kent University for, you know, that whole time. So I'd just love to see all the, the visuals of them trying to uh, uh, spray down the university after all the bishops leave. You know, there, there's just so much here. I think the British government may have to cancel Lambeth. So, oh boy, all these in intriguing things we got. So anything else you want to talk about? We've done coronavirus for 33 interesting minutes. Um, Indian corruption. I uh, know, it, which is, it, it's horrible. Um, I can't think of nope. one non-corrupt Indian ministry. I was going through some paperwork the other day and it's just crazy. How about... How about the new agenda of the Ugandan Archbishop? Sure. Uh, he uh, uh, He's Stephen Kazim, Kazimba, K-A-Z-I-I-M-B-A. I said well, Kazimba last week, you, Kazimba. Well, well, I don't know if we recorded that show. Um, let's let people know there's a new primate and uh, give us a quick brief update on that and then talk about the politics. Well, the Global South and GAFCON primates uh, led by... Uh, Foley Beach uh, installed the new Archbishop of Uganda and two Sundays ago and this past Sunday he was installed as the Bishop of Kampala, the metropolitan mm -hmm. see of Uganda. And he's hit the ground running. Uh, he has the same theological bend as his predecessor, Stanley and Tagali, but he is, uh, I should say, a bit more aggressive. Uh, Stanley and Tagali was aggressive, but in different areas. Yes, he was. This, this fellow seems really keen to move into uh, the poor, the working uh, poor, the people who flood, uh, move, flood huge slums that are developing around the towns and who are basically moving out of the settled order of uh, village life. So the new archbishop basically sees the threats coming from three directions. Uh, militant Islam, Pentecostalism, and Western governments and NGOs trying to teach uh, different morality. So the Church of Uganda sees itself, how are we going to respond? Well, we're going to respond by getting into the, into the hovels, into the slums, proclaiming the good news of Jesus Christ, and not just uh, uh, sitting back and telling people what's wrong with them but really getting out into the world. It's a very activist approach. And I, I pray God that it's successful in what they seek to do. Amen. Amen. So, Gavin, you are in France. When are you going back to England? Uh, five o'clock tomorrow morning. Are they going to let you in? Uh, yeah, oh, I, yes. I think, I, I, I think the people coming, uh, the, one goes by a car ferry, and the car ferry is huge. And, at this time of year, there's usually only about 40 people on it. So it's much more a matter of, of keeping away from other people if you if you feel anxious on the ferry. But otherwise, you're in your car. And so uh, um, I, I dare say the customs people might might wear gloves. Does they handle your passport? And um, uh, perhaps they're even wearing masks. I, I, I don't know. But I think um, things are going to change, I think, it, over the next month. But for a moment, they're still at a fairly primitive stage. Well, you are at a primitive stage because Brexit just happened. And whereas Britain wants to be a separate nation and no more European uh, law and no more European Union to control them, it takes a while. It doesn't happen overnight. Uh, mm. If you want to have customs again, you have to get the passport machines and set up all the stuff that used to be part of the infrastructure 20 years ago mm. uh, to have more passport controls. But until then, the border is still kind of porous between within Europe and, and Britain. Yes, the, 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 the board, people may not want to hear this. The, the borders have been fun because during the course of the Brexit negotiations, the French immigration authorities slowed the cars down. So it sometimes took you three hours to get out of a port 
where it used to take you 20 minutes. Wow. <laughs> because they, did, they didn't admit they were doing it just to annoy us. But, <laughs> but actually, <laughs> it was perfectly clear. Anybody who knows the say, French knows they were just doing it to be <laughs> snobbish. <laughs> yes, yes but inter interestingly enough, it's now changed around and it takes a very long time to get into England. But this is just human nature. I, I think one of the things I'd like just to finish up theologically by saying is, is that um, people are asking questions about theodicy. Theodicy is, of course, the philosophical theological area where you say, if there's a God of love, how can we explain all this suffering? Why does he allow it to happen? Um, I, I find the pressure of theodicy changed a little bit by the sense that the fall really has happened. And, and Jesus is very clear in the Gospels that, that the ruler of this world is Satan. Satan says to him in, in the desert temptations, look, I've got all this. I'll, I'll give it to you. You just have to change sides. Um, I, I think the fact is we, uh, we live, as C.S. Lewis said, in occupied territory. It doesn't belong to God. It's, ru it's run by other people. And this conflict between virus and hum the virus and the humanity is part of this, of this conflict that, that is riven through the universe. Uh, the price, of course, for uh, it's the price of having our, our, the, our freedom. Um, and so in one sense, one can either see the coronavirus as, as, the, um, as the consequences of an irresponsible God who doesn't love us enough. Or else you could say, well, actually, if I'm going to be given my freedom, I'm going to be in a flawed world where there's a conflict. And this is the price of my freedom. Uh, do I want it or not? And in my case, I think, yes, I'm very glad to have it. Thank you very much. I shall die soon anyway. Well, we just, we just had our teaching on salt and light, you know. We're not in a world of salt. We are the salt. And may I uh, go ahead, George? I uh, wanted to touch on viewer mail uh, before. Sure. Uh, Gavin's maid is in the background vacuuming, and <laughs> <laughs> he's at the so castle in France. So you know, it's, it's Iris, <laughs> housekeeper, uh, the woman who come and does for Gavin. Uh, I had a viewer viewer mail about, and this, and my answer is I have no clue. Uh, Gavin, what do you think, uh, Kevin, what do you think of these things, Enneagrams, I think they're called? Um, no, I know about Enneagrams. And I said, I have no idea. I vaguely think there's some Jungian thing, or that might be the Myers-Briggs no, personality. No, it's, it's young. It's, it's young. Well, what, is, what are they... Good, bad, and different—a parlor game, or are they demonic, or what? Do you, what um, did you, I couldn't answer the question. I had no idea. They're a kind of Christian version of star signs, really. So, a, a, a semi-Christian, semi-gnostic, uh, semi-psychological version of star signs. Essentially, what people like to do is we like to put things into categories because it, it gives us a sense of order, and we can recognize and name things. Uh, and, and each of these are ways of naming aspects of personality or personality traits and behavior. Um, the, the ludicrous thing is they make absolutely no sense um, objectively when you ask, you know, how did, how did Jung in particular come across Myers-Briggs? And, uh, and the Enneagram stuff is, is, uh, has a more oriental roots. But in practice, they seem to work quite well at describing how things are. Um, so they, they've been part of a fashion and a fad, and like anything else, uh, if you, te te you touch them lightly, use them lightly, they probably don't do too much harm. But there are lots of people who get into them and think, "Well, this this is almost like a new religion." Uh, uh, this is my identity. With Christianity attached. Yes. Yeah, that's right. But when yeah. people, if you're going to use this in a therapeutic setting, it's a little better than benign. Y yes, it tells you how you think. I, I object to people saying I'm, I'm an INTJ Christian just yeah. as much as I do saying I'm a gay Christian right. or I'm a straight Christian. You know, it, we're just a Christian. <laughs> when you use this as part of your identity, you're doing it wrong. Because, and my daughter, my oldest daughter was really into this when it first came out. Oh, I, look at this. I said, I want you to take the test in three months and you tell me if you have the same answer. She did. Completely different. You know why? We change. We grow closer to God. We have more experience and we understand ourselves better when we understand God better. And I said, take it again in three more months. It's completely different, Dad. Yeah, it's supposed to be because you change. You cannot make that your identity. It does help explain why you dislike people. Oh, yeah. I just... <laughs>
<laughs> and, and then, and then, uh, and then, of course, the gospel comes in and says, "Okay, that may be why you dislike them, but Jesus is why you get to love them, uh, because you you see more of Him in them than you see of this particular personality type." So again, it's always it's how you use it. They can be fun, but also also dangerous. It can be fun, but it can be used in a therapeutic uh, situation a little better than benign. I would like one somebody to sit down and try and answer it as Jesus would. That that would be fun. Try and try and give me his uh, uh, acronyms. So ah, but then we'll st we'll get into a wonderful academic argument. Would Jesus have answered in an Aramaic or in Greek? <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> did Jesus speak Greek or did he speak Aramaic? Mm -hmm. Was he an well, introvert? I, no, was he an introvert? <laughs> no, actually, that's that's a real live academic debate. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, not for this show. Yeah. Cool. Let's talk briefly because we're about truth and honesty about internal debates we have on the Anglican scripted. Gavin, <laughs> you're not going here. Kevin, well, yeah, are you really going here? Yeah, well, why not? People, <laughs> people love us because we're honest. Yeah, you know, and we have a true friendship, and we're united in Christ. And everybody here, George. Kevin and Gavin bring fringes to our unity. And Gavin mentioned he was going to Holland uh, two weeks ago and he was going to be at a conference and they were going to talk about Marian aberrations. And the comments in Anglican Unscripted went, I'm not going to say berserk, but they're going, what's a Marian aberration? Some people never heard of it. I can't believe Gavin said that. Has he gone off the rails? And Part of Roman Catholicism, some people within the Roman Catholic Church f fully believe in the Fatima, the aberrations of Mary. Some people don't. That's just part of the Roman Catholic uh, subculture right now. But we as a group are united in Christ. Gavin, George, and Kevin come here and sit in front of the cameras, and we have more that unites us than divides us. And I, we have no trouble with Gavin going to Holland and talking about Marian aberrations uh, to the people there. But Holland's interesting. Ho <laughs> Sorry, Kevin. Go on. Holland is interesting because uh, it's almost it's post Christianity there. They they need somebody to come and talk, tell them uh, about historical church and about Jesus. And if they want to know, have questions about aberrations, I don't have a problem with that. What did you talk about in, in Holland? Holland is a very progressive society, as people know, and um, uh, liberal Christianity has suffered a huge hit. Uh, there was a there was a um, a man called Hugh Benson, uh, and Benson was the son of the Archbishop of Canterbury in uh, about 1907, uh, and he was ordained an, an Anglican priest, and then he thought twice about it and became a Roman Catholic, and so this created a lot of excitement because the Archbishop of Canterbury's son becomes a Roman Catholic. But he wrote a very interesting book called The Lord of the Worlds, which was a futuristic sci-fi book um, describing authoritarian culture. I've been trying to read it again. I, I don't like it because I don't like sci-fi entertainment. I'm the opposite of Kevin for, for personality types. But, but one of the things that Benson said was that uh, he foresaw the collapse of Protestantism. Don't blame me, guys. This is just this is in the book. But 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 the, the Catholicism would would be the last man standing. And in Holland, that's almost true. Uh, but there are two kinds of Catholicism. There's very liberal and progressive, and and there's a, a more traditionalist kind. And the traditionalists are feeling really with their backs against the wall. Uh, they feel very unloved. They're saying they're getting pressure from their bishops and pressure from their people. Uh, and they asked me to come across and cheer them up a little bit. Sure. So I did. I did two things. I I uh, gave a lecture on uh, what what the ideas that lay behind cultural Marxism and why they were so antithetic to Christian understanding of of our own values. But also um, looking at the reasons why some people do believe the Marian apparitions actually are, are the cosmic equivalent of Our Lady interfering at the at the wedding of Cana as she did. Uh, and the Eucharistic miracles, which because in eighteen because in nineteen ninety four you could send um, you could send particles of a Eucharistic host that was bleeding to a lab and ask them to tell you what it was and what they came up with was quite extraordinary and suddenly for the first time since Galileo science appeared to justify Christianity so that's that's excited a lot of people and I, I went 
although you know the ridiculous thing is many of these people i thought would know much more than i do uh, who on earth was i to go and tell them i think they were probably excited that i discovered them too so we were all uh, we were all essentially trying to encourage one another in the supernaturalist context that the lord had this matter in hand because faith in europe is 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 disappearing and um uh we we're glad to be encouraged that, that I, I guess that the, the, not that God is in control, because I think that's theologically improper. Um, but the Lord has called us to be who we are at this point in time, Amen. and we need to keep faith with Him. And I, what I want the viewers to know is, you know, we have no trouble talking about topics. What you you don't want us to be, and I and I truly believe, this, is apologetics for the fringes. We're not going to be. We're apologists for the unity we have in Christ. Well, and also I think the thing that. Uh, is fascinating and when you listen to us talk is that we come from such very different backgrounds. Gavin comes from a post-Christian uh, cultural in, Marxist yeah, sure. world of Europe. Um, I uh, was at a baseball game on Saturday. I took uh, Phillies versus the Red Sox. I took a whole bunch of children from an orphanage and from our church down and about 40 of us, we had three rows. And since I was working, I had my collar on. 20,000, uh, 10,200 people in the stadium as capacity crowd. And the deference, the kindness, the, the, when I go walk around normally dressed like this, it's just normal life. If I have my little dog with me and I go into Home Depot, everybody wants to pet it and talk to me. When I walk around the baseball stadium, it, I can't get around because people want to stop. They want to talk to me. There's a, I live in Christendom in this part of the world, that the clergy are given deference, that the clergy greet, you know, you're a person who is doing a good thing and people want you to know that they appreciate that. That, as I understand it from Gavin, is as far from culture in England uh, as it can be. Now, maybe it's Lots just a baseball are. crowd are all good people. <laughs> but uh, That's American baseball, son. <laughs> Hot dogs and Jesus. No, but but see, you know, here, so when I so from when I come from my perspective, I come from a very American, very individualistic, libertarian, Protestant Christendom culture um, that has shared common values. That uh, maybe if I went to a NASCAR event at Daytona Beach, I'd get the same response. I don't know, but you know, it's such a different world than what Gavin describes that I that I live in. I think the keys to Anglican scripted are uh, our camaraderie and friendship, the news that we're willing to talk about, and we don't uh, put smoky mirrors up. We talk about the hard topics. And we have no big uh, trouble doing so. We hold the church accountable. We hold ourselves accountable, and we covet your prayers. You know, you as an audience are you know responsible for the show just as much as we are. We want you to pray for us individually. We want to pray that we're not tempted by money, power, or uh, sexuality, and that this show could continue to encourage the church to be uh, salt and light on this earth, and that you know, 2020 is just the beginning of what this show could be, not the end. Uh, we pray for those uh, who contract uh, coronavirus, that uh, your immune systems could handle it, and I suspect for the next several months, we in one degree or another will be reporting on how the church and society is reacting to this virus. And it's different. We have to understand this is the first big virus since the invention of the iPhone, since Facebook, since YouTube, you know, since Twitter. And so how you consume your information. Since the Phillies won a World Series. <laughs> since the Phillies won a World Series. You know, this is, this is the first time in a long time and it's going to be interesting of where we're going to get our information from. And it's important to George and Gavin and I that we give you the most accurate information about this because neither one of us are, are doctors, but we are out there always listening and we're telling you what we're hearing. I'm Kevin well, Call. Gavin's a doctor, but he's not a proper doctor. Yeah, he's so. not a real doctor. It's like a <laughs> I was going to say, shall I, shall I jump in? Oh, no, it's so tedious. <laughs> Shut up, I do no, no, no. He's like a chiropractor. <laughs> is that what you're saying? <laughs> not a real doctor. Optometrist, <laughs> Optometrist. or uh, <laughs> podiatrist or something. Like I'm George Carter. Yeah. 
Uh, and I'm Dr. Gavin Ashenden. You've been listening to episode 581 on the 10th of May, 2020. It's a privilege for us to be together. Thank you. Thank you.